Hello everybody and welcome to this next session of Pragati Vichar Literature Festival. We have with us Mr. Bhaswar Mukherjee, um, no, a renowned author. I will let him introduce himself and the book that he wants to talk about and then we will take it from there. So Mr. Bhaswar, uh, over to you. Thank you so much Kapil for that introduction. Uh, well, my name is uh, Bhaswar, as he has mentioned, Bhaswar Mukherjee and I have uh, written, I have been uh, an author who has contributed in a number of anthologies, about 11 anthologies. And I've also got a solo, a solo anthology which came out last year in 2020. It's called It Happens. And it was essentially a clutch of short stories which have, which had got selected at a prompt, uh, you know, at, at the Times of India uh, crowdsourcing platform called Write India. And I was very lucky because a lot of, um, you know, stars of the literary firmament like Amitabh Ghosh, Ashwin Sanghi, Nayantara Saiga, Lupamanyu Chatterjee, they all picked up my stories uh, for their respective prompts, which appeared in the top 10. Uh, and uh, this book, which I'm talking about, which, which we're going to discuss, it's, it's, I'm, I just uh, can introduce the cover right now. This is what it looks like. It is uh, called The Counterfeiter. It's a story on uh, the Abdul Karim Telgi scam, which happened uh, many years back. Um, running predominantly, uh, you know, 2003 or so on, it peaked. And then, of course, once he died in 2017, it was, there was a remission. So this is the book which we're talking about, uh, which is my first nonfiction, and it's due, uh, it's due out in, in January. Yeah. So, so that's so, my introduction. Sure. So, so uh, I mean, moving to nonfiction, uh, this particular book, what was the reason? Okay, it's an interesting question. You know, uh, when we actually started looking at the at the various things on nonfiction and scams, uh, I found, we found that we, when I'm talking about, I'm talking about also my literary agent, the book bakers and Sohail Mathur. Uh, when we were discussing and basically doing a what we call blue sky gazing, uh, we found that uh, in the for the uh, the Delhi scam, uh, there were two books which had come out. One was by uh, Sanjay Singh. Uh, it's called uh, Reporter Ki Diary, which was in the Hindi vernacular. It came out in 2004, much before, uh, you know, the a lot of developments happened in the, in the Telgi story because he died in 2017. And the next one was actually a, sh a short compendium which appeared in a book called Dangerous Minds by S.L. Hussain Zaidi and uh, Bridget Singh. So we felt that there was this huge gap because the story had never been told. So what uh, what I did was with the help of someone who's in my, my friend who's in the in the legal department. He's actually an advocate and a partner. We I dug up the, all the cases related to Abdul Karim Telgi and I recreated the story. So it was I call myself a sutradhar actually in this whole scam or the story which happened. And that's how the, this book came into being because actually we realized that although there have been lots of newspaper reports and videos and so on and so forth. There has never been a chronicling of the story. How exactly did this underdog rise from a small station called Khanapur, where he used to sell chikus and pears, to become such a large scamster? What exactly happened? How was he able to game the system? Okay, uh, starting from uh, uh, whether it was the um, India Security Press or the police or the politician, what exactly happened? So that's how the story came. Sure. So I'm sure you are the sutradhar of the story, not the sutradhar <laughs> of the. No. Anyway, um, so in some ways, would it be fair to say that this is not a chronicle or this is not the story of somebody who was, you know, inside the, uh, the game, whether it was as a sufferer or whether it was as a scamster, it is actually the true chronicling of the story from, call it a dispassionate, uh, dispassionate, unbiased point of view. Absolutely, yes. This, this person obviously had no clue. In fact, uh, until he met a guy called Ram Ratan Soni, he had no clue about this entire world of counterfeiting. Sure. And that also it, it happened because he was put in the same prison in Mira Road as him. That's how it actually has started. Before that, he was, it's not that he wasn't doing it. He was actually you know, a travel agent who was trying to get the people who were not allowed to emigrate abroad by you know, changing the papers. He was there. But uh, if you look at if when, when one reads the book, you realize that he actually started in a very humble way. He was a good student, a fairly merit, meritorious student, uh, but he was a very, very laid back person. In fact, when he joined his job first at Felix Industries, which was selling furniture, he got thrown out because he couldn't meet his sales targets. So he was a very laid back kind of a chap. Then he went to the Middle East, Middle East where he could not, you know, again, do any, keep any work. And that's when he came back and found the quicker way to make money. So he was not somebody within the system who had kind of got groomed, but he somehow was able to, you know, actually reach that pinnacle which we are talking about today, if you can call it a pinnacle. <laughs> sure, 
Sure. So, um, you know, over the past few years, there have been numerous stories of a variety of different kinds of scams that have happened in India. Do you think it's just the expansion of the economic system that has caused it? Or is there something more sinister, something more uh, insightful that one should look at when they look at such scams? No, you know, there, uh, this, is a, this is a very, very big question and it has got a number of, uh, shall I say, dimensions to it. Um, so if you look at the first dimension, which is legislature, right? Because when something goes wrong, you expect there to be a legislature. Now, it's not that there was a lack of legislature. If you look at the legislatures, like if you look at the Prevention of Corruption Act or the Benami Property Acquisition Act, or if you, if you look at all these acts, if you find that they were all there, okay, so now we have got an Economic Offenders Act, we have got a Whistleblowers Act. So there are lots of been these acts in place, but there are two things. One, the frequency with which we have come up with an amendment to these acts. So the first two acts I spoke about, the first amendment happened after 25 years. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying that when the, when, the, when, the, when the corruption is happening or as the, as the landscape of corruption is changing, I need to change my laws to keep in touch, that has not happened. Okay, that's the first thing. So the first, the second thing is about intent. How much do I want to actually communicate what is happening and reach a solution? So for example, you had the NN Vora committee, which actually came up with very, very sinister findings when it came up after the Mumbai blast in March 93, when it came up with the Vora report where it spoke about the nexus between politicians and the underworld. And it was a 158 page report and only 11 pages of those got ever known to the public. This was despite a minister filing a case in the Supreme Court, it never got known to the public. Sure. All right. So, or if you talk about the Malimath committee, in fact, I speak about that because one of the things which happens in this book is about how Telgi appears in court because he's so ill, he appears through video conferencing. Now this whole idea about looking at uh, or, or having a criminal uh, uh, case uh, review, etc., and using a video conferencing facility was one of the recommendations of the Malimath Committee, which happened in 2003. But there are 158 recommendations that, that has been made, and none of them have been fulfilled. Sure. You know, and then this whole nexus which we see between the politicians, the police, we saw a part of this getting played out. You know, this whole thing on uh, Sachin Vaze and uh, you know pa Parambir Singh uh, with going off. Mm -hmm. And you know, when, when I read these stories, it seems that I have already read that because it's happened in the Telgi situation exactly. You know, so it's, it's quite, uh, so there is a pattern. Okay, so one is transparency, one is the intent. Okay, and so uh, th these are the few factors which I kind of, uh, which, which kind of make this such an ugly game. Otherwise, if you look at in terms of the legislature, etc. And of course, there are lots of other things which are mentioned in the book. Uh, so there is a chapter which, which is the penultimate chapter before the appendix where I talk about the stamping in India, where I speak about it's, it's called the, the, the famous last words, where I talk about these things. Yeah, so yes, that, this, is, uh, uh, this, is, this is something which is, uh, there, are fair, there are too many dimensions to it. You know? Sure. So do you think the scamsters, scamsters in India have just taken advantage of the loopholes that are present in the Indian financial ecosystem? So yes, so the fact is that when I create a, a create a, a, any law or a, a standard operating procedure or a, or a you know a system, that is based in good faith, and you know unfortunately unlike a system which is created for uh, you know a, a system which is created for uh, anything which which can be dry run and tested, there is no dry running or testing of this. So when you create such laws, the only test is what happens in reality. But the question is how soon am I reacting to it? Now, when this Nirav Modi scam happened, if you look at the nub of the problem, it was essentially a fact that the CBS, which is the core banking system, and the messaging system were not on the same platform. Sure. Now, it find, I find it very difficult to believe that, yes, A, it was a loophole, but the fact is that this has been going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. And you've got internal audits, you've got statutory audits, you've got concurrent audits, you've got RBI auditing, and you couldn't find this problem right through it. It seems to be, you know, it seems to be very, very strange. Or the fact that if you look at a cooperative bank problem and the fact that the depositors are the ones who have got the main say in cooperative banks. So when, uh, you know, uh, Housing Development uh, uh, Industries Limited was being given 60% of the loans by PMC, which was another big scam in the country. Mm -hmm. How come? Because there was, that's, a, that's an operational loophole or a, or a lacuna in the very structure of a cooperative bank structure. So it's the, 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 the loopholes will be there because they have not been tested. But as soon as something comes to light, how quickly do we react? That's essentially the crux. And do you think and that's you, where I think we have failed? 
do you think we as a country have done a good job at that plugging those no loops? no we haven't okay we okay. haven't done that we have we have been very very reactive sure very very reactive so uh, and I mean, that also very very slow <laughs> sure so in the past i have had a conversation with someone uh, i won't take names um, okay. around a big scam and uh, that person had a point of view that there are three things in the world one is robbery where you you know put a gun at somebody's head and you steal something from them one is theft where you you know uh, are still doing theft mm -hmm. without the other person knowing and the third is manipulating the system and his point of view was manipulating the system is you know something that everybody does and it is not illegal, illegal. well you know in this particular scenario i I, th I think we of course went beyond the legal boundary but i think that's an interesting take on looking at how the financial system is structured and why it becomes extremely necessary to plug these loopholes uh, within the system absolutely now you know uh, kapil sorry to interrupt so we 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 talk about indians being very good at jugad right so jugad essentially would be that if there is something uh, in a, a better way to do it i do it and you know and, and as long as that's for sustainable livelihood that is as long as that is for somebody's well being that's fine but when it is for uh, looting the public then i think we need to put a stop to it then i i don't think that that is permissible sure <laughs> while i while i hear you and i hear this all the time indians are great at jugad but i look at the financial markets in the us i look at this entire concept of spacs that is gaining traction these days you know special purpose acquisition vehicles and what all is happening i don't think we are good at jugad at all i mean unicorns are being born every day in the us based on money that has been borrowed by, by somebody from somebody for something and it is being used for something anyway you know uh, le let's move absolutely right you are absolutely correct yeah. let's move ahead that we have gone far away we have gone far away from cash flows and actual profits to looking at what is called gross business value or eyeballs uh but that has happened and if you look at the way in, even in our country the way the ipos are happening so if i am a promoter and i know i can go public i can keep on taking my good salaries and i can keep on drawing money and then at the end of the day i can get out because if you look at it the ipos have all happened the question is how much of it is an ofs or offer for sale is when you are buying back from the promoter and how much is a new money coming yep. into the company yep. if majority of it is ofs i can sell you can i can come out of it you know with at a huge profit after pauperizing the company absolutely so that and, is happening and that's the question that i keep asking uh, is flipkart a success or a failure uh, is paytm a success flipkart zomato so many stories exactly now okay kapil let's look at something else since you have raised this whole thing of loophole and i think it's an interesting so what happened was banks who have got a lot of stressed assets largely public sector banks were told that yes you have to now downsell your assets to the asset reconstruction companies right so there are 15 asset reconstruction companies total sale i think has happened is a little over 1 lakh crores Or mm -hmm. thereabouts at a cost of fifty-four thousand crores. So mm -hmm. the way it happens is that the asset reconstruction companies pay you something like five to ten percent of the total value of the asset, and the balance they give you certificates saying that we owe you the balance. But depending upon how the recovery happens, we will they give this money back to you. Now sure. think about a promoter who has stripped assets from his company. Okay, that that loan has become a loss. Mm -hmm. The asset reconstruction company takes money from that promoter. pays it to the bank at 5% and this asset reconstruction company then sells the same asset back to the promoter to recover the rest so the promoter is able to buy back his company at a fraction of the cost now this has happened because you know economic times ran an article that 850 crores or something were found in you know a lot of these asset reconstruction company cases so this is what i'm saying there is a loophole the question is that if it is if say if somebody looting the system then somebody has to put a stop to it sure you know so that brings me to the big question who do you think uh, must read this book and what do you expect the reader to get out of it you know i have got a very fundamental thing i think everybody who is afflicted or upset with corruption must read this book if i am worried about the fact that uh, you know 15% of the cases ever get uh, you know ever ever come to light in terms of actually there being a judgment Uh, and there is some very crazy statistics. I was I was reading the National Crime Bureau uh, site. So between two thousand one and two thousand fifteen, they have got only fifty four thousand cases against corruption, compared to you spoken about theft and robbery, compared to five lakh uh, you know murders and three and point eight lakh robberies. So less than ten percent of the cases. We cannot believe that corruption is so less, right? Sure. Because if you look at a site like I paid a bribe, that's a very famous site. in the same period there were 1 lakh 16000 cases reported which was double the number which was at the national crime bureau 
so which means either we are too inured to corruption or we are saying look it's not my problem i don't want to talk about it unless it affects me but the problem is my friend once it affects you then you become a victim then there is nobody else to help you because everybody is thinking the same way so anybody who is affected by corruption and wants to know how was this actually scam perpetrated what what happened you know how would how would things misused uh, should read the book sure so your book says that it's the complete story of the counterfeiter and scamster that has never been told before so can you give us i mean i understand we will get the details when we read the book but can for our audience can you give them some pointers some kind of quick uh, overviews on here are some of the things that you probably did not know all right uh, so uh, there, there are there are um, so when when i when i went through the cases looking at uh, looking at the book in terms of the chronicle how were the dots actually connected okay so for example uh this guy was born somewhere in the 60s and then he did a school college and then he went for a job so you know how long did he spend there when did mm-hmm. he come back how did he get into the first first heist or whatever that that scam was uh, because that was under the uh, immigration act he got actually and then how did he meet ratan soni so this entire chronicling is not there anywhere okay this entire sequence of how it actually happened how did he start up so how it, there was a process of washing the paper what was this process of washing the paper okay uh, 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 the, then the, the the situations with the institutions buying from him why didn't they know that special adhesive stamps cannot be bought from a stamp vendor they can only be bought from the uh, from the offices of the stamp office nobody nobody knew that sure. and you know th- those kind of detailing is there in the book you know how did it actually happen so how what was the S- how did the sit come into play what was the reason that the home minister of uh, maharashtra actually resigned what was the real reason okay uh, so those are the kind of detailing and how the connections have happened uh, between what telgi did how did he scam the the, the you know the the uh, the indian security press in nashik what exactly happened so he set up a company called unique enterprises which uh, wanted to started bidding for these machines because telgi realized that this whole process of washing was fraught with risk right because of the fact that a washing did not give them actual uh, you know perfect uh, stamp papers and of course he had to pay pay speed money so it was not just worth the effort so then his company this unique enterprises how did they actually get into uh, you know for when when those uh, when when those uh, uh, when those auctions happened how did they buy the machine now when they buy the machine the plates of the machine need to be destroyed because otherwise anybody can use it to make new stamps right sure. which is exactly how did he game the system he actually got the machines with the plates okay so sure. he had he got in touch with one guy with the deputy general manager and how he bribed him so all that kind of detailing how he moved from just doing you know uh, shall we say uh, grade uh, grade bronze kind of uh, scams to getting to the platinum level how did he actually do it sure how did he and how were the police involved for example why was why why, why was one a particular police inspector not actually caught on a particular day because there was a way in which he was sent to do some chapa in one place and pick up stamps which were not belonging to telgi but said you know or belonging to telgi but was attributed to somebody else because he was not the only person playing this game there were other people so how was he able to game the system to get the others uh, you know his his own uh, crimes loaded onto others so all that has been chronic in this game mm-hmm. sure. and that is something which has never been done before sure see sounds fascinating now um, fundamentally um, you know and a lot of people ask this question for variety of different scams punishing the guilty or recovering the lost funds what do you think should take priority and why kapil i am very convinced both are important then i'll tell you why uh, because if i cannot make an example out of someone i am not going to be able to make it act as a deterrent so if somebody knows that if i am a malia or a nirav modi and i can get enough money to go and stay abroad right or a mehul choksi then that there is there where is the so the getting that person back and now that is very very it's not easy because you're talking about jurisdictions across continents and getting them back is not easy the second thing is also getting the money back mm-hmm. and there are these strange estimates and i've used the word guesstimate in my book saying that about 1.3 trillion dollars have been sent abroad all right the black money which has been sent abroad the 1.3 trillion dollars my friend is 50% of your gdp <laughs> you're the fifth largest nation in this world your gdp is 2.94 crores a trend 94 trillion dollars so which means that if i could get that money back you and me wouldn't have to pay taxes for the next 13 years sure that is the kind of wealth we are talking about 
So both are important. One is public money has been siphoned off. They have to be returned. Second, people have to be made an example. Uh, and I, I, I have, I've come across actually fairly strongly in the book because I feel that way. See, we keep looking about, look at looking at a murder or a rape or whatever it is and feeling very bad that this kind of a crime has happened. Now tell me, for that small technician in Kingfisher Airlines who is unable to feed his family or the 3,000 gems and jeweler manufacturers in Nirav Modi's factory who were denied their livelihood and perhaps a lot of them have killed themselves, what, who pays for these crimes? Should we calling the white collar crime? Because there are, there are actually deaths involved here. Or say the bank, which actually allows terrorist funds to be routed through their account or through their counters, which creates you know, weapons of mass destruction and thousands of people get killed. So are we talking with the same yardstick? No, we shouldn't. These are as criminal as crimes themselves. Sure. So we have to change the entire legislature when we talk about these crimes. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you talk about changing the entire legislature, uh, what would be some key changes from your perspective that should happen in the financial structure? They could be within law and order. They could be within judiciary or within, uh, you know, the executive branch coming up with new, uh, new legislation for it. Or they could even be in the financial segment itself. Right. So um, there are two, three things. One, uh, and I'm going to first try and try and give the big picture. So one is we, everybody talks about punishing the criminal. Nobody mm. talks about rewarding the guy who's in, who's got integrity. I think we need to reward integrity first. If you want more people to be good and not put their hand in the till, you need to be, you know, need to reward integrity, which doesn't happen. The second thing which happens is, unfortunately, despite of all these audits I spoke about, regrettably, nothing much has happened. We have seen these crimes happening despite all the regular audits which have happened. I mean, who thought you and me would have, would have never thought that, you know, one, uh, one Prashant Jain who runs uh, some three murti perfumeries would have 200 crores found in his house, right? Who apparently wears, uh, you know, sandals and slippers for wedding uh, weddings. We will never think about it, but there are people who are doing this. So second thing is we need to basically revamp our, uh, the, you know, you know, Protection of Whistleblowers Act 2014, because one of the things which the U.S. has done fairly well is, uh, you know, reward as well as protect whistleblowers. Now, if you have somebody within the system who is willing to talk, and who knows that that person will remain safe, that becomes a very important person within the organization. And, and we know this for a fact that organizations, they have, everybody has a whistleblowers policy, but nothing much has been done about it. So I think these are two main areas which need to be focused on. The third thing, there have been, as I was speaking about the Malimat Committee recommendations, and I was speaking about the 158 rec recommendations, there is a lot in the criminal justice system. So for example, you and me may want the police to uh, come to our house if there has been a dispute. But that is not his real job. His real, this is called a non-cognizable offense. His real job is in trying to tackle the cognizable offense. So we must leave time because these guys otherwise get stretched thin. Or for example, when someone is arrested, the judicial custody is only for a period of 15 days. Now that does not allow uh, the person any time to be able to complete it, which means that you know, I have to go back, get permission, if somebody's moved to judicial custody, bring him back. So these are the, some of the areas which need to be, which, which need to be very seriously addressed. Third thing is when a government uh, uh, or a government servant or someone working in the government is, has got, is, is go, going to get arrested, it's not always a problem with the prosecuting agency. Very often the rules and regulations do not allow him to be arrested unless say, so for example, if there's a police officer, the police commissioner has to sign it. So those are some of the, you know, some of the red tape we must cut out if we want to deliver speedy justice. Okay. And also sometimes I think the, the our main body, which is the Central Bureau of Investigation, unfortunately, you know, it's, it's called the gilded parrot because everybody believes that it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the arm of the center and it will always protect the center. And if you notice a lot of the cases, so if it's Maharashtra, West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, they've all stopped CBI from investigating the cases because they believe that, you know, they will not get speedy justice. So even in the, you know, Telgi book, you initially had the state arms, which was the special investigating team and the stamp investigating team in Maharashtra and Karnataka respectively called the SIT and the stamp it, who were investigating. And then it got moved because the Supreme Court ordered in 2004 that it had to move to the CBI. Now the question everybody is asking is what would have happened if it had stayed with these agencies? Would it have been better? So this state center trust is very, very important. I can create all the laws. But unless there is a trust, it does not get operationalized. So 50,000 crores of cases cannot be investigated by the CBI simply because the state government wouldn't allow that. Sure. So there are 
lots of these areas which need to be addressed for this entire problem to get resolved. Sure. So novices like me uh, always believe that a lot of these scams are perhaps, I mean, a lot of these scams and more importantly that uh, the fact that nothing gets done on top of these scams is because everybody from the polity to the, uh, to the law and order to judiciary gets involved and, you know, is part of the nexus. Um, what, what's your take on that? There, are, there is enough and more evidence to say that that is true. But that is because, again, it's the, the chicken or the egg situation. If everybody, which, no matter where they are, knew that I would actually get Im impacted if I did something wrong, they would stop doing it. Right? So we are talking about, so if you are talking about, I was reading somewhere that the India Today, I think there was an article, that the 2019 uh, members of the Lok Sabha, 539, the, the, the members who have got cases against them rose by 44% from 2009. Sure. So now, if, so those are the issues we must address. You know, the, the, I can make all the stringent rules, but unless everybody knows that they're actually going to get enforced, they are not worth the paper they're written on. So uh, there are lots of areas which can be addressed. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, this book propounds to open up these areas, but it has asked some questions saying that, can we look at this? Can we look at this? Can we look at, can we look at, uh, look at white collar crimes differently? Can we move it out from the civil uh, status totally to the criminal status? And how soon can we do that? How can we improve transparency? Let people know what is going on. Or then those kind of questions. And, you know, if we, if we do that, then obviously anybody, regardless of whether he's a police officer, whether he's a lawmaker, whether he's a politician, if you know that, okay, you know, I might get exposed or something might happen to me, then there is a deterrent. Unfortunately, is that the way to work? Should we always have some, a whip over somebody's back? Isn't there something which happens, you know, organically? That yeah. is where you have to start rewarding integrity. Because if you don't reward integrity, that fundamental change will not happen. Sure. So what, I mean, let me get back to the book. Um, what was the most difficult part of writing this book? Very good question. The most difficult part about writing this book was trying to assimilate the actual sequence and how things happened by looking at all those various cases. So it was like, uh, you know, you look, you, you're like a fireman who, as soon as he's put out a fire in one place, there is another one starting somewhere. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you believe that, okay, you've got a hang of how he did it, there is a new angle which comes up in Delhi or somewhere else. And there's some case there and there is a new player. So that, but it was, a, it was a very, shall I say, interesting process of discovery. The more it challenged me to find out exactly how are these all connected? Okay, how are these players connected? What exactly did they do? Okay, uh, and also what is also very challenging because if you look at the, the SIT report, which was basically the report on which Sanjay Singh had based his first book on, uh, it talks about, you know, what are the allegations on this report? But the, the counter view of the parties who have been kind of said that you are wrong, you are wrong. What is their point of view? I, I thought it was important to present that as well. Sure. Because then you know, then the reader can take an unbiased view of okay, saying, okay, fine, this is perhaps what may have happened. So those were the challenges in the book. Sure. And what but was, it was a challenge I enormously enjoyed. Sure. Perfect. What was your most favorite part of writing this book? Uh, well, I had never attempted a nonfiction before. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to, you know, draw a very fine line between uh, ha putting, making it fact actual at the same time retaining enough, enough interest because you know i am from the financial world i've worked in banks for most part of my life i now run a, a, a training and consulting firm on banking so the financial sphere is you know quite i'm comfortable with it but how would a person who's who doesn't understand finance how would that person understand that book in fact my appendix i've got a whole thing on stamping in india okay so he, the guy he must need to know what's the difference between a document and an instrument sure. right uh, what are the various kinds of stamping why is stamping important? What, is, what does it do legally? And in a language which does not kind of, you know, intimidate or throw him off, the, there's not too much of legalese or jargons. So that was, uh, that was a challenging part. A, keeping it factual. At the same time, getting enough interest so that, uh, you know, that there is a story which someone can identify with. Okay, you know, this, this could have happened to somebody. Sure. Hey, we are running out of time. Uh, you know, any okay. last words that you would want the readers of this book to remember or to look out for. 
Yeah, you know, um, uh, I, I, I leave my leaders, readers with one thought at the end, uh, which I'm going to say again here. This whole thing about the fact that we are, each one of us as a brand ambassador of India, right? And if we believe that there's something wrong happening, and we might either believe we can solve it, or we believe that we can raise it, we must do one of the two. If we, every person can do that, if every reader can do that, I think this book would have served its purpose. If the book can inspire people to at least do that, saying that, look, because if you look at the way in which the scam was perpetrated, it was a matter of a lot of people shutting their eyes. Sure. Otherwise, it wouldn't have reached these proportions. Sure. So, for example, the, you know, Telgi, the, the way he used to run this is basically he used to get a stamp vendor because his license got cancelled in 1995. It got awarded in 94, it got cancelled in 95. So, he used to get other stamp vendors, use them as a front with their license. Now, someone who's an LIC or Indian oil says that, hey, I'm making a payment to this stamp vendor, the company's in somebody else's name. Why am I not making the payment? Why are there two different entities? Simple questions like that. Sure. Nobody asked. Sure. So that is my fundamental question that all of us are working in areas of responsibility. So if each one of us can at least do that, you know, this book would have served its purpose. Sure. I'm sure the readers are going to read your first nonfiction and they are going to say, how unreal, man, how is it even possible that somebody put something like this up? Uh, so with that, thank you so much, Mr. Bhaskar, for coming on Pragati Vichar Literature Festival for sharing my thoughts from your book and for talking to us about it. I'm, I, I really wish you the best of luck with this book. I'm sure the readers are going to enjoy it and I'm sure they are going to get a lot of learning in terms of not just in terms of what not to do or, or you know, how to be more responsible, but also in terms of what can they do to benefit society, to benefit India and to kind of keep their surroundings cleaner as well. So, Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kapil, for this platform, for this opportunity. It was wonderful talking to you. And last, I just want to leave you. I don't know if it's visible, but this is the book. Uh, so, uh, so, you know, this is the, what it, the book cover looks like and the book will be out soon. So uh, please do read it and uh, please do give feed, uh, feedback, laudatory or otherwise, because that's the only way I can ever improve. Absolutely. <laughs> and um, for, for our viewers and for our readers, uh, please do watch out on frontlist.in. We will be talking more about this book, I'm sure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kapil. And all the very best for the fest and all the other people and participants. Thank you. And the people who are viewing it. Thank, Thank you. you once again for the opportunity.